<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this, this is really cool because I know Sydney was on with you the other day. Yes. So this is great. What a wonderful painter she is too. Wow. Oh yeah. All right. we're, all, we're alive. Excellent. Hi, I'm Bill Davidson and I'm the guest host for Eric Rhodes today and for this whole week. And we have a stellar lineup for you this week and it's going to be really exciting. And our first guest up is Wendy Caporelli Green and she is a portrait artist that's amazing. She does both oil and she also does pastel. She teaches and she's from the New York area and she's going to do an incredible neat thing for you today relating to the eye. So we're going to look forward to it. Wendy, what do you have for us? Okay, thank you very much, Bill. That's a lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, just do a, a tutorial on a dimensional um, representation of an eye. Um, I just thought uh, this might be something that um, could be useful. Um, and I, I do want to preface this by saying when you're trying to get a likeness with a, por with a portrait, it's not about getting a perfect eye or a perfect nose or a perfect mouth. It's much more about proportions. But obviously, at the same time, you really do know how to render those different components. And one of the important things about getting um, the feeling of dimension is uh, the lighting effect on your subject. Um, in this case, this particular eye. And by putting the light in a certain manner, and in this case, I put it from the top left. Um, so it has a raking kind of effect and it shows the um, uh, definition of the eye socket area. So you see all the planes and how those planes are affected by the light. So um, that's basically what I'm going to do. I thought this is a good way of just kind of focusing on one aspect of portraiture that, um, that may be kind of troublesome for, for some people. Well, I find this very intriguing because I think this can apply to a, uh, not just portraiture, but painting flowers, painting trees, painting apples, anything like that. So for you Absolutely. people that aren't into portraiture, don't go away. This is going to be very interesting to see. And you can learn something all the time, especially from somebody as talented as Wendy. So we got a few Thank things you. we need to talk about right now. And uh, we'll be right back to you, Wendy. Okay. It's Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host, Eric Rose. All right, so welcome back. Now, first, I want to mention today's prize. We have Eric's marketing book. So in the comments, write where you're from and uh, for your chance to win that. So I'm on the Monterey Carmel Peninsula where my studio is. So make sure you put in where you're from for your chance to win that. And last show's winner was Eddie Dukel, I think, D-U-K-E-L, from Jacksonville, Florida. So Eddie. If you would, you won value specs. So if you would be kind enough to email ASL at streamlinepublishing.com to claim your gift. All right, we're gonna go back to Wendy and really look at how interesting and useful this is gonna be for us. So Wendy, it's up to you to let it rip. Wonderful, I'm ready to get started. Um, first of all, um, I'm putting my gloves on. I always wear gloves when I work in pastel. And if I fail to mention that I'm using pastel as my medium, now's my chance. Um, so I do wear gloves um, to protect my hands. I have prepared a schematic drawing for the eye so that I can be, uh, so I spend less time on drawing when I actually am applying the, um, the color or the, uh, uh, the pastel to the surface, um, only because it takes me some time to draw. And I really like having an accurate drawing for a pastel before I get started. It's very important because pastel is not as forgiving as oil. So you, if you prepare a passage and you have to change it, if you have to change it radically, you have to scrape everything away. And I find that to be a laborious, unpleasant uh, prospect. So in any event, I'm starting with this schematic drawing. I'm very I was very conscious of the planes of the eye. Um, as I said, the light is coming from the top left. So there's a little shadow 
um, on the side of the nose, um, which you can barely see to one side, but the side, the right side of the eye is what is in shadow. Um, and Bill, just let me know if I'm standing in, in the wrong spot, just in case. I want to make sure that the audience is able to see what I'm doing. No, um, so we can, you're in perfect spot right now. That's okay. great. Great, great. So um, there is shadow on the right side of the eye and, um, and the eye socket. And then, so I'll be modeling from right to left, from shadow towards the light, um, except for the shadow, obviously, on the side of the nose. Um, I want to pull out my plane head for just a second to just show you the plane head version of an eye. So this is what I'm really conscious of. Um, Unfortunately, the light is not in the same position on this eye as it is in my drawing, but I just want to make you aware of the, the different planes of the eye, and that's what I'm going to be conscious of as I start to render this eye. That's a so, great example. That's fantastic to show that. <laughs> and actually, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Bill, and one of the other things I want to mention for anyone who works from photographs, and we all have to admit we do, a lot of us do, um, it's two things. It's really important to work from life as much as possible because there's so much more information. Yes, it is a little harder. Um, you know, with a photograph being very static, it's, it's much easier to render in one regard. However, the photograph doesn't have as much information as, you know, because of that, it also has that negative side because you can't walk around your subject. You've got a two-dimensional surface that you're working with. So having a plain head like this in your studio when you're working from photographs, will give you the information that you need to uh, to fill in, um, you know, whatever is not in the context of the photo. Um, but again, the most important thing is to work from life as much as possible. So I think I preached that enough. I'm going to get started. Um, so I'm going to start with working on the dark aspects, of, the shadow aspects of the eye. And I'm going to start in the corner, um, this little uh, dark red corner. Um, is actually called the caruncle. I was told by an um, ophthalmologist who was in my class a number of years ago. So I'm just going to start with a deep, it looks like a Lizrin pastel to represent that corner. And it's also the underside of the lid that we're seeing, the thickness of the lid. Um, so I'm going to just lay that in in a mass. I'm not too concerned about the slight variation I see in color. I'm, I'm keeping this more mass light like, but I'm also using a fairly light touch so that if I have to go in later and add more color, um, I, mean, I will be able to do that uh, because I haven't filled up the tooth yet. So starting with that, um, then I'm gonna quickly go to the eyebrow even though that's not part of the eye, but I, I always find that structurally, it's great to put the eyebrow in because it reminds me that the eye is in a socket. And I'm conscious of that. And uh, this is the top of that socket. So again, I'm kind of laying this in with a tone that's a raw umber. I'll press a little more heavily where I see things, you know, passages are darker. Um, like here on the under part of the brow as it starts to turn in towards that eye socket area. Um, and I'm just gonna get that whole passage in place. I'm going a little lighter on the outer edge of her brow because it thins out. I'm saying her because I know who this model is. She posed for my class um, uh, about a year ago and she was a lovely model and she had beautiful eyes. Um, okay, so I've laid that in. Um, the next part I'm going to do, again, uh, focusing mostly on the darks, is the lash line. And I know this sounds kind of tedious to be focusing on, um, on the lashes, but it's really that dark line that I want to represent. And you know, in a simple fashion, but just so that we're aware of um, that deep dark. Well, it's already we're... starting to give it form, Wendy. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we haven't even got started. So, uh, but I'm glad to hear you say that. And a good, 
that's a good point to bring up, Bill. As you start putting in the darks, I'm letting the the um, tone of the paper, which is a light middle tone, represent the lights and the lighter areas because I just haven't gotten to them yet. So as I put start putting in the middle tones in, I don't even have to put the lights in and it will look dimensional because the light of the paper will be representing that. Um, so let me finish getting this lash line in um, and then I'll address any other darks. I'm seeing a little, well, I'm seeing the iris. I should mention too that um, I'm laying in the iris now, but generally when I'm doing a portrait, um, especially when I'm working from life, I lay in, excuse me, I'm laying in the pupil. Um, I generally lay in the entire iris with the local color of the eye. I don't bother with the pupil until later on in the development of the painting, because then I can really see where the, um, where my sitter is focused and, um, and I could get into more of that detail. But because this eye is so large and because I wanna be able to represent um, an entire eye, of course, this is a big part of it. So I'm laying it in now. Um, next, I'm gonna get into, um, and actually I should mention, and I'll try and mention the colors as I'm going along. That was a dark gray that I just used. I used an alizarin for the corner of the eye. I used a raw umber for the brow. Um, now, can you explain what local color means to the audience? Yes, definitely. The local color of the eye is the predominant color that you see in a certain passage. Um, the, the overall kind of color um, in, in a landscape, for instance, if you see a mass of something, you try and determine, and I shouldn't be using this as an analogy, Bill, because you're the specialist on landscapes, but you, I would think that you create or you use one particular tone that represents that whole mass. And, and that's in effect what the local color is. So in this case, the local color of the eye is blue, but there are variations. And the big variation that you wanna be aware of is the difference between the shadow and the light. So that we're, we're talking about a value difference, which is very important. That's what I'm going to address next. That there is, well, excuse me? Well said. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, there is a slight shadow um, underneath the lash line um, that represents the cast shadow from the thickness of the upper lid that is cast on the eyeball itself. So I'm putting that in. And again, this is another thing that's not necessarily showing up so well in the photo or not, not very clearly, but because I know this from experience from working from life, I'm going to put that in. Um, so that's next. Um, and I find your statement working from life absolutely accurate. And I also think that, you know, because Really, the, like you say, the camera can't capture everything and it really misses a lot in color, I think. Exactly, exactly. And I'm sure you have this too. Um, I mean, I could certainly make this analogous to um, landscape painting. When I'm working with someone in front of me, it's so much more exciting right. to have, you know, to have that little dialogue, just to have the energy of having a model in front of me. Same thing with the landscape. I don't like painting landscapes from a uh, photograph, the little I paint them. I love being out in the outdoors and experiencing it because there's nothing like that. It, it's a whole different level of painting. Oh, I agree. Yeah. So there is a dark rim to the iris, which I'm going to lay in now. Um, using an indigo blue, a deep indigo. Um, so I'm just, just bear with me as I lay this delicate area in. Okay. Oh, I Quite interesting. This is very interesting. Uh, well, I'm glad you think so. I'm really, I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to take, again, get, getting back to the local color, um, a pale blue that I'm seeing for the predominant color in the iris to represent that. 
Another thing I want to mention when I'm painting, um, when I'm painting a subject, I often like to record. Well, I, I do have a sequence and I should mention this, backtrack just a little bit. I have a se sequence of working. I work from dark to middle tone to light. Um, however, if, if the uh, model is wearing an interesting color or a color that I can easily identify, I try and get that in very early because I find that that's going to affect the kinds of colors that I put in the skin tones. So I'll start with the background, certainly, and I usually start with the hair because that generally, well, when it is dark, um, those are some of the darker passages usually. So I'll start with the hair, um, which normally frames the face, and I know I'm simplifying, oversimplifying. But if there's a bright color, like I'm wearing a, a very rich green color, I would try and record that because again, I, it's going to affect the kinds of colors that are in my face. It may reflect into some of the shadows underneath my chin. And I may just want to make the colors in my skin tone stronger to balance the kind of color that I'm seeing in my shirt. So um, I'm probably talking too much. Let me know no, if I'm talking too much. No, no, I, I find that fascinating because that is, I always say this, that color is always moving on you. So when you add a strong oh, color, yes. all the other colors look different. So I'm so glad you touched on that. I, I'm, I'm very glad that, that we're, we're certainly in agreement. Um, and you, you also brought up another important point. Color is affected by all the other color around it. So in other words, if you were just to try and render my face um, with the kinds of colors that you think you see and then put my shirt in afterwards, I could probably, I could probably tell you in advance that the colors in my face will not be nearly as interesting and as rich. My point is that one color, as you said, one color affects the other. And it's, it's important to be very conscious of the relationship of colors, how they relate to one another as you're, um, as you're, painting so i think that's what makes color a little bit difficult I, absolutely absolutely um and another thing that we often talk about when um when we're working with models is um to get the background wait there was a point i was trying to bring out and i, I it slipped away from me oh my goodness my age is showing It'll come well, wait, back, and when it does, I'll. I'll is I'll it relating the background color to the face, or somehow, or something? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. When I'm working with a live model, and I'm, I'm working in class with my students, and um, they're um, conscientiously trying to paint that background when the model is away from them, I tell them to wait and wait till the model gets back up on the model stand and look at that color again when they're in front of it because it's gonna look much different. There's gonna, or I shouldn't say much different. There's gonna be a slight difference in the way that color is perceived by the artist when the model is in front of the color. They may be able to identify that color and nail it without the model being there, but it's gonna look different and, they, and you want to make it work with your subject. So um, colors I, relate. That's an excellent tip. That applies in landscapes too. Uh, that's very interesting. Well, we have to have more of these conversations about the parallels between landscape and no. and, um, and portraiture. And maybe it'll make me less intimidated about getting out there and trying some landscapes. <laughs> I think you'll be fine. You've got all these, I mean, these principles are all, it's amazing how they correlate. Yes. So I'm using a, a raw umber now um, to suggest the uh, the shadow on the outer corner of the eye and also underneath the eye um, on the lower lid. So let me just mask this in quickly because um, I see a cool passage here in this shadow and then there's a little cast shadow from the eye to the right. Um, and then again, this, this is um, following the contour of that sphere of the eyeball within the eye socket. So this side is gonna be a little deeper in value. And then as the lid wraps around to the front of the eye, it's not quite so dark. She's a young woman, so certainly she didn't have a lot of um, 
baggage under the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Those are earned. That baggage is earned. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> As is the gray hair. So now do you find that you have both cool and warm passages in both the light and the shade? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a very good point. Yes, um, definitely. There are cools in both, and I, I, it bears repeating, there are cool tones in both um, lights and in shadows. And of course, they're relative. So, um, you know, relative to one another within those certain passages. Yeah, I think that term relative is operative and color and temperature so much. Yes, right. So I'm using a color called Caput Mortem to represent this crease in the lid. Um, and actually I'm going a little bit lighter as the lid wraps around the eye. Same color, but just a lighter value. Now I haven't touched much on values or I haven't emphasized it enough. Values are extremely important when you're dealing with color. Um, it's, um, it's one thing to be able to re represent a color, but it's more important that the value, the relationship of values be right within the context of a painting. So I'm gonna go back here and just deepen this just a little bit. Okay. Um, all right, let me get the um, next value of raw umber to just suggest, this is a little lighter value of raw umber, not quite as dark as the lid. I just want to lay in the suggestion of this shadow of the nose beside the eye. Now, could you spell that color for the crease um, so we viewers yeah. know exactly what it is? And I better look at the, the stick of pastel, otherwise I may misspell it. It's caput mortem, and it's C-A-P-U-T. And then a separate word, M-O-R-T-U-U-M. And um, it is Latin for deadhead. I thought it had something to do with that. <laughs> yes. Mortem is the, the key, the optimum word, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, all right. So I want to continue this laying in these shadows. I see another shadow on the outer corner of the eye, but on the brow area, not on the eyelid, but above that, which is a little bit lighter. So you're nailing your values. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. I think painting is all about um, that delicate balance of values. Okay, so um, this outer corner I see more as coolish, greenish. And this inner corner of her eye is warmer. So it's a, a similar value, but not quite as, um, it, it, it's warmer, excuse me. I'm just looking for this, the color as I'm trying to um, speak um but similar in value similar in value exactly it's a light shadow it's not not a real deep one it's kind of as the shadow starts to turn into that eye socket area and i see a little bit of no oh, I, I still see a little raw umber here underneath the brow too as it starts to turn under Okay, so um, I'm going to take another, uh, let's see, another value of caput mortem and continue to model the eyelid. So there's a warm dark tone on the eyelid, which I'm laying in now. And then as I come around to the front of the eye, it's lighter, but an interesting thing starts to happen. I'm using a lighter version of caput mortem, 
but I'm finding it's just a little bit cooler than I want it to be. Now, caput mortimer is a warm color, it's a red, but there are warm reds and cool reds. So I may have to warm that up with um, something that has a little more yellow in it. Um, and I'm gonna locate something in my set that might do that. Um, let's see. I'm looking yeah, for I, something. I, I'm sorry? That's really good because I think it's really emphasizing the relativity of temperature and color and how relative it, people get confused on temperature. And I think the relative, exactly. is what they're missing. Yes. I and I, I've had discussions with artist friends about the um, dividing a color between color and temperature. And um, some people just don't think it's that important to be able to be, to be that specific but I feel it's very important because um, I divide a color. A, a color is very different whether it's light or dark and you have to be aware of it. I think you're right. Cause I think that temperature variation is what gives a painting a certain energy and a vibration. Definitely, absolutely. So I neglected to put the well, not that I neglected, but I, sh I should have done this a little sooner, but here it is. I'm gonna to start to put the shadow in on the right side of the eye, the eyeball. Um, so I'm using a light touch with this gray, and then I'm gonna find something just a little bit lighter because I think this is getting too heavy and too dark for this particular passage. This is amazing. Oh, that's that's a very kind of you. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Incredibly interesting, too, from my perspective. Yeah. I'm so glad. So I'm just laying that in. Uh, people often ask, um, well, my students often ask if I blend my pastels. And the only way I blend is by taking another stick of pastel and using it over in a crosshatch kind of fashion. Um, that's the most effective way, I think, um, there is to blend colors. So does that leave some of the under, under color showing through? Exactly. Exactly. And that's the reason why that's, well, that's very astute of you. Yes. Um, because if you, if you use your, your finger to rub it, I feel like it's, um, when you mix too many colors of oil paint, you just make mud, but with pastel, because it, it has this textural effect, I like to bring out that effect. And by cross hatching my strokes, you can see the color underneath, as you pointed out. And, um, I think it's so much richer. I agree. Okay, so I'm using a raw umber, a light value of raw umber underneath her brow to show how that's turning in. I'm laughing as I look at my, um, at my screen, the eye that I'm using as reference is right in the middle of my forehead. <laughs> I look like a cyclops. <laughs> oh, that's your third eye. You're seeing. Yeah, my third eye, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I'm just representing that little subtle fold that I'm seeing. I also see a, another warm passage in here um, in this corner that I want to lay in. And I see it more as a golden kind of color. Um, and I did select, I mean, I, I did a couple of different versions of this eye in preparation for this demonstration because I wanted to make sure that I had my colors available um, because I've got tons of pastel sets and finding the color is what takes the most time. So, I, I located the colors that I need and I have them um, separated from the rest of my set because I've got hundreds, literally hundreds on the table. Um, and I'll show you my studio later. 
if you'd like to see. But by taking the time to find those colors, it, it saved me time during the demonstration. Well, that was very nice of you because I'm sure it saved us a lot. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I just wanted to be able to represent um, as much as I'm seeing while we're actually working. And it, as I said, it takes time to, to find the right kind of color. And if I took too much time to do that, I'd be um, taking time away from the demo. So uh, let's see. I'm gonna take a lot of arrows in your quill. You're using everything. That's what I want. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> okay, so I think this is this looks like a burnt umber, a light burnt umber. I'm going to use this for this corner to suggest that slight uh, change in direction of that plane. Um, I'll point to it on this head. It's right in this corner. So the, the shadow on the side of the nose is darkest, and then there's a turning plane as you go towards the corner of the eye. Again, a great example. So I'm also seeing, let's see, some of this warmth here on the outer, outer area of the lid. Um, I generally uh, work my, with my portraits over a long period of time. And I'm always surprised when I take the time to just do a three hour study or an alla prima kind of painting, how valuable that exercise is. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and I, I have to remind myself to do it more often, but I find it so exciting to just be able to identify the colors and values in one sitting and not have the opportunity to go back and, um, and adjust things. And I think it's a better mindset to be in um, to do that because it, it forces you to be accurate from the onset. And do so you find the, the more you get right in the beginning, the easier it is to finish? Oh, yes, definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that does take, at the same time, it takes some confidence when you put down those first colors yeah. um, and you start questioning yourself already and it kind of sabotages your your plans because if you try and gauge what those those values and colors are at the beginning and leave them and let it slowly evolve until you get everything covered then you could more accurately see that relationship of colors and values but Initially, you want to try and get it as accurate as you possibly can, and that, that takes practice. There's I nothing agree. like practice. Yeah. I always think of us as being um, more like musicians because musicians practice all the time. Because um, I have non-artist friends who, who wonder why I'm constantly working. Um, and honing my skills, they they feel okay. You've you've arrived. I don't feel that way, but um, my non-artist friends seem to think so. And I have to remind them that um, it's constantly practicing. That's that's what helps you to uh, really grow as an artist. And it's not just practicing. It's it's that engagement in the studio as you're constantly working. Um, you start to see things and you start to imagine things that um, I wish I could put this well. Um, there's, there's something that happens during that process when an artist is in their studio. They start to make connections and, and come up with ideas um, in a way that, that is unique to working independently, um, you know, in isolation. Oh, I think that's a great point. And I think you said it very well. And I, you know, that's that you're always growing. You're never going to get there. And exactly. you're always on that upward spiral, which keeps it interesting. It, it absolutely does. Because it, it, as one of my students mentioned to me, if this were easy, none of us would be doing it. 
<laughs> We'd be bored. We'd be bored, exactly, exactly. And we're anything but that. There's nothing more exciting than, than either being in the studio with a model or being on site to, to paint the landscape. I mean, it's, it's all very exciting. Okay, we have a question from the audience here. Do you have yes, a certainly. favorite way to lift the pastel color if you're not satisfied with it? A favorite way. Um, it depends upon how thick the pastel is. If it's very thick, I, I use a, a single edge razor blade. I'm looking for one, but a single edge razor blade and very carefully scrape it away. If it, the pastel isn't too thick, um, then I'll use a kneaded eraser and just dab it um, and pull up some of that color. Um, but yeah, that is necessary. If, if you, um, if you put in a passage that you want to change, then, um, it is necessary to pull up the color because it's going to affect whatever you put on top of it. So now there's a little warm passage on the, um, inner part of the eyelid, the lower eyelid that I want to represent. Um, and then there's also, okay, this is a little rounder. Um, there's also a warm um, kind of a lip. I'm not putting this well. It's the thickness of the lower lid. And in many cases, it's warm on someone Caucasian. Um, unfortunately, this photograph isn't showing that. It's, it's just a light, bright, cool color. Um, and again, this is where working from life gives me information and knowledge that I wouldn't have had if I were just working from a photograph. So let me represent that. It's a little brighter. Oops, a little brighter um, at the same angle of where the, the light is hitting her, um, her iris. This area of the lower lid is where it's brighter. And then as it wraps around, it gets a little deeper. As it wraps around the sphere of the eye, it gets a little darker. Amazing. All those value shifts are giving incredible form to it. Well, there's, there's so much um, going on in, a, in an eye socket area. That's why I thought this would be a good study. Now, let's see. Let me get some lights in here. Actually, this is more. Uh, this isn't quite the light that I wanted to bring in. This is more of the kind of tone that I'm seeing happening under her eye that I want to represent first. And Love then, the way you're checking and adjusting things all the time. Oh yes, yeah. I, although, as I said, I try to um, try to represent um, what I'm seeing as accurately as I can at the very beginning. What, what you're doing really I like is you're catching it quickly. If you see anything, you're, you're fixing it immediately so it doesn't yeah. stay on there. Exactly, exactly. I've, I've um, chided my students at times when I go up behind them and they're, they're working on a certain passage and they've created a color that's so far off from, from what we're what we're seeing and they say, oh, well, I'm going to fix that later. And I say, well, you're not going to be able to represent it in quite the same way because it's affecting everything else you're doing. So yeah, words, yeah. If, you, if you start with a color, you put a color down, that's going to affect everything else around it. So um, that, that method of thinking, I don't think is helpful. I think you're dead right. I call that painting to an era. <laughs> yes. Gives you more yeah. errors is all it does. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And again, it goes back to that, um, that relativity that's so important when, um, when you're painting. The relative colors, the relative values. Such an important word, relative. Yes, definitely. 
So there's a little inner corner that's always pretty bright when the, eye, when the um, light is coming from above. And this part of the lid is catching some light. So I'm putting in some highlights now. Um, I'm seeing some warm tones that I um, should have represented. So just bear with me. Oh, it's great. And you've got, <laughs> you've got time. You've got another 15 minutes, I think. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So let me... Um, so my talk didn't distract you too much, I guess. No, no, not at all. Not at all. I mean, your questions were, were relevant and, and what we were discussing was relevant. So that's, that's when it really is, um, you know, it's not distracting at all. It's, it's when, when I'm trying to work and, and someone asks me something that has nothing to do with what I'm working on. And although I want to be able to answer, um, it's hard because I have to kind of take myself out of the dialogue that I'm having with my work and thinking, think about something else in order to answer the question. That's what makes it difficult. And don't we all have a dialogue with our, our work? <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be a positive one. <laughs> oh, definitely. Okay, so um, now I would, uh, let's see, I still want to get some warmth in here underneath the brow, and I have to strengthen the brow by deepening it. Um, let's see what I selected for that area. Hmm. So by deepening, okay. it'll strengthen it. Yes. Yes, it'll strengthen the whole image because um, right now it's it's lighter than than it appears. I mean, everything's kind of light. It's at a at a certain uh, point. But as you mentioned, as I feel more confident about what I've um, chosen in terms of the colors and values, then I can strengthen them by pressing a little more heavily and making the color more apparent. It gives more contrast to the eye. Sonic. Yes, exactly. So I'm seeing a little more warmth here that I want to add. Um, I'm going to go back to the eyebrow and, and deepen that a bit. Yeah, so when I'm doing landscapes, I'll go through mm -hmm. two or three runs, and you, that's what you're doing, right? You kind of go into another run. Yes. Again. Exactly. But I'm amazed that you're you're able to go through two or three. I'm assuming you're you're talking about when you work on location. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, because everything changes so quickly. Um, and I would imagine that's that's difficult to do. I find that easier than watching a model move around on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I haven't yeah. done many, but I thought, wow, this is hard work. Yeah, it can be. It can be. I always find myself more tired after working with the model than I do working from photos because your your eyes are trying to adjust the model with every with every step um, as you're working. So you're, you're conscious of them moving even the slightest amount. So it's cerebrally challenging. Okay, so we have a question. Okay. And so from Indianapolis, uh, what type of paper are you using? I'm using uh, Canson. Me tientis, me tientis. I always have a hard time saying that, that word. Um, but it comes in a, a variety of um, colors. Middle tone colors, I should have mentioned this earlier, middle tone colors are what I would recommend working with in pastel. Uh, by working with a middle tone color, all your colors register um, 
when you first put them down versus white when you put darks down obviously they they read very well but if you put a light color down it looks darker than your surface and i always found that find that um, disconcerting so i like working from the middle tone um, so this particular um, surface is the uh, canson which is a very nice surface to work with um, i also work with um, textured surfaces which i love because that enables me to really build up a lot of pastel um, whereas paper you you do get to the point where you saturate the surface and you're not able to apply any more pastel canson is pretty good but um, i mean in that regard but um it still has a certain uh limitation and not that it's a bad thing it's just you know however however many layers you choose to to uh, put on your pastels, that, that will make a difference, um, you know, based on what surface you're using. And there are so okay. many materials now. Oh, Matt, go ahead, Bill. Another question. Yes. Will, will you spry your finished drawing with a fixative of any sort? No. Nope. Um, I, I know the manufacturers are not going to be happy to hear this, but I don't like fixative. I don't find that it's useful for protecting pastel because it still is very vulnerable until you put it under glass. The only thing that I do find um, spray very useful for is if there's a certain passage of the painting that I want to add more pastel and I've built up too much color there to add any more layers. Um, if I spray it, I, I mask off the, the rest of the painting and I spray that particular area, it gives me more tooth so I can go back in and um, add a little more color. Interesting. Yeah, so that's where I find it useful. But other than that, I, I don't find um, spray to, to do what they, they profess that it does, which is protect the pastel. I don't think it does. And actually it darkens the pastel. Now, I think you're on the fabulous Realism Live faculty, too, aren't you? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And I'm so excited to be participating in Realism Live. This is the first time I'll, um, I'll participate. So, And I'll be doing a, a portrait of my friend David. Um, or I've actually already done it because it's, um, I had to do a video. And then I'll be answering questions um, with, I believe it's with Eric um, at, at the conference. Well, so I'm not sure his enough. is going to be as insightful as my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you two duke that out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh. So I'm just strengthening the uh, pupil a little bit, giving it a little more depth. This is really cool. I'm loving this. It's looking I'm just so like oh, I'm so delighted. Let's see what else I can do. Um, I can go into some of the warmer tones I'm seeing in her brow, because when you're dealing with hair, um, there may be a local color, you know, brown or blonde, or um, but there's lots of variation in color that happens within hair. And certainly the effect of the light on the hair um, certainly influences the color. So I'm adding just a little more warmth. Again, that light making color relative. Yes. Yeah, so I'm adding a little more uh, or a darker, excuse me, a, a heavier pressure on the... All right, so here's uh, an interesting question. They say you selected your colors. How many mm -hmm. values would you select two, like prior, how many? Yeah, for this, Ooh, let's say that, for this pocket. That's a really hard question to answer. Um, so, hmm. I, I didn't count that, them. I'm, you're somewhere around at least 10, I would think. Oh, yeah. Um, well, okay, so the darkest values, let's let's kind of identify them. The darkest values, obviously, are the lash line, the pupil, 
this shadow um, within the eye, the corner of the eye, then I think the next darkest value would be the brow. So that's two. And then there's shadow here on the side of the nose. So that's three. And then some of that shadow is here, but then there's something a little lighter. That's four. Um, this is a little lighter still, a little warmer. That's five. We're getting up there. Yeah. <laughs> but it'd be hard yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, you got a lot of value shifts, which is yes. what makes the it really roll well. Exactly. Exactly. And, I, and you, re you really pulled the colors for convenience. So it was not a matter of, so that you didn't have to look for them while you were doing the demo. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I did that, as I said, for a reason, because it does take a lot of time to locate the kind of color that I need. And I have so many sets of pastel. The, the one thing I know I've put myself at a disadvantage because I don't just use one set of pastels. I use a lot of different ones. Um, they all have different properties that I think are so exciting. So, you know, I want to be able to use them. Um, but that, that does put me at a disadvantage because I don't become as familiar with a particular set. So I'm reaching for colors and I'm not quite sure what I'm going to get until I see them in context. Um, and each, each manufacturer um, has their own, you know, a palette of colors. Um, well, and each color is a value, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So and I think that's, you know, it's hard to see sometimes because yellow looks lighter than it may be in value. And ultramarine blue, a lot of times, looks darker than it really is in value, I think. Right. Exactly. And the other thing is, um, and I'm, I'm glad you're, you brought up this conversation because um, one of the things that I mentioned when I'm teaching is to, um, to try a stick of pastel. In other words, if you're looking at your set and you locate a color and you're not sure it's going to work, don't try testing it on the side of the paper or don't dismiss it if you don't think it's going to work. Try it in context, in the context of the painting, see how it works with the other colors before you dismiss it. And you might be surprised at how effective it could be, or it may be a, a total bomb too. Um, there's nothing lost in other words, but that's how you, you infuse your, your paintings with more and more color, which is what I love to do. I mean, that's what pastel is all about as far as I'm concerned. Um, I remember reading at one point that um, Cecilia Beau, um, who was a wonderful turn of the century um, oil painter, uh, portrait painter, she traveled to Paris because she wanted to increase, her, she wanted to have an opportunity to increase her color within her portraits, and she studied pastel there. Um, so, well, I pastel is wonderful. <laughs> I can see how you would be a fabulous teacher. You explain things very accurately. Well, thank you. Amazing. That's very kind of you. Thank you. I'm not being kind. I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I have to say, I teach the way I learn, which is I have to have an explanation for something. And you can imagine what kind of student I was. Um, an annoying one, because when I was told certain things, if I didn't comprehend the logic of something, I couldn't grasp or I, I couldn't accept it. So I had to understand why I was doing a certain thing. And that certainly applies to painting. I, I wanted to understand why I was taking certain steps and why I was achieving certain things. Um, for what but that's I, worth. And I'm I feel like you say that because I'm the exact same way. And if I don't know the, Are you? the why, then if you know the why, then it's easier to do the how. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And to repeat it. Um, I always find it very frustrating when the uh, teacher couldn't answer the questions. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But you've done a fabulous job. I think we're getting close on time. Okay. How much you got left? I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, on how much you, oh, on your painting. Oh, you know what? I really, I could stop at any point. I mean, could I make this more refined? Of course I could. Um, this is, I was hoping to be able to just show you how to get started, what to think about, um, 
you know, how to continue to develop it. Certainly I would, I would fill in more, um, more of the texture of the paper. Um, I would fine tune the colors a little bit more. I would be very conscious of working from dark to light, maybe strengthening some of the darks and working on some of the middle tones. I think there's some more rich middle tone color that I could have um, interspersed that I may not have put in yet. Um, so that's how I continue to develop this. But, um, and certainly if I, if I had a model actually in front of me and I was able to see all the intricacies of the eye, I could add more, but this is, this is kind of a generic looking eye, the way and it, the photo isn't ideal. So um, there's a lot of detail that's kind of missing, but it's a simplified enough image to be able to just give you the, the basics of um, structuring an eye. Oh, I think you did an excellent job on this. Well, and I, thank think, you. I mean, I really think it's worthwhile and uh, Realism Live, you'll be doing a full live portrait, right? Yes, I will. Yes, absolutely. Um, and actually, and I, I should, you know, um, I should explain, um, there was an hour long, it's an hour long demonstration. So I did it, I encapsulated more time working on the portrait. So um, the way I did it will enable you to see my taking the portrait further than if I had just worked for one hour, if this makes any sense. Um, if you had just followed me for one hour, just with the, the tape going, um, I wouldn't have gotten very far. But what I did is actually encapsulate a, um, a much longer length of time and just put the highlights into this, this presentation. So well, You'll that, be able to see the portrait completed. As well, well, that's that's really exciting. And so <laughs> Realism Live will air like November 9th to 11th. And it's an incredible lineup with Burton Silverman. Uh, we got Wendy. We got Jim McVicker, Cindy Barron, Paul Crowder. It's a, be an incredible event. And um, if you want to sign up, uh, take uh, I can give you a discount code. Use Davidson, D-A-V-I-D-S-O-N. And even if you're like a expressionist type painter, this Realism Live is really a way to really just learn more. I'm all about the more I learn, the better I get at what I do. And don't be afraid to step out of your area and get into that type thing. Um, as we go through this, you'll see that learning is great for you in every way. And if you have a growth mindset, you get better at everything you do. And I always like to tell people that when I first started learning to paint, I took like 20 something workshops in the first two years. And I'm continuing to, to watch these things like Realism Live and where you can do it from the comfort of your home and you keep learning great things like Wendy just showed us. Um, so sign up for this. It's a good, it'll be a great event. It's always great to learn more. And again, just go to D-A-V-I-D-S-O-N is your discount code. And uh, you can go to windycorporal.com to find out more about her. And um, if you want to look at some of my videos, just Google Bill Davidson Artist. I have four out with Streamline. So continue to learn. I think that's the way to keep yourself growing and keep yourself interested. Uh, you can never learn enough. And as Wendy and I talked about, um, it never stops. And that's the greatest thing about it, because if it did, you'd be bored to death. So keep it interesting. <laughs> keep going. Keep learning. This is what it's all about. Um, and I'm very happy that we were able to have Wendy here today. And uh, if we could, if we could get Wendy back on to add any more final comments, I'd love to see her one more time. If it's possible, you still there, Thank Wendy? You. That's very kind. Um, I'm, I, I can't tell you how excited I am to be uh, participating in Realism Live. Um, I was so thrilled when Peter Trippi called me and um, I said yes, even before I knew what was involved. So <laughs> this should be a lot of fun. And I, certainly the lineup of artists is uh, phenomenal. Um, just so many wonderful names and you'll be able to learn from so many different people, which is really, really exciting. Um, so Bill, thank you so much uh, for hosting. Uh, it was a, a pleasure to get to know you just a little bit. Um, I look forward to catching up to you at some point at a, an exhibition to actually see your 
paintings live. They're quite beautiful. So well, thank you so much. It was my pleasure, and I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, it's uh, this is my first hosting experience, so I good for you. Up. Wow, my I first didn't... one. <laughs> <laughs> I would not have guessed you were a neophyte. <laughs> And I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was excellent. And I love the way you're gonna uh, you, your demo you're doing for Realism Live by having a longer and then kind of shortening it so you get more compacted in there so people can learn more. That's incredible. Yeah, I'm I'm glad to hear you say that. I was conscious of the fact that um, I find demonstrations, um, live demonstrations, as much as I enjoy them, I want to be able to show. Um, show what I can do over a period of time. And it's really hard to do that when the time is limited. In this way, it, it encapsulated by editing, you know, more footage so that you could actually see the salient um, aspects of uh, my teaching that that would be useful, so. Oh yeah, I can see how you would be a fabulous teacher. I really love oh, the explanation. You. Your communication skills are incredible. So that just made for a great presentation. Day. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Realism thank Live. I'm going to want to watch you again. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And are you on Realism Live? I should No, ask. no, I'm too expressionistic. So I probably don't fit in that mold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've done uh, I've done the uh, main stage at the Plain Air Convention a couple of times and uh, ah. and things like that. So I'm more, I don't wow. know if I quite fit in, but I do know this, that uh I have to learn to paint it more realistically first before I can get looser on it so that I actually know what I'm doing and not just throwing paint at something. I, I, I'm sure you're not doing that at all. I, I mean, I'm sure you're very much aware of how to do it representationally, and that's what enables you to do it much more loosely and freely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't really want to have to go through that process, but I'm glad I did now. And uh, I, I really enjoy it because I think just watching you do that eye was really helpful for me. I won't be applying that in trees, mountains, all kinds of things. I found it very interesting. Oh, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's very kind. So, <laughs> yeah. So look Wendy up and go uh, take a workshop from her and make sure you catch Realism Live and you do get your discount code. Again, it's D-A-V-I-D-S-O-N and uh, just uh, Google us and find us and try to learn from us. And we're always happy to help. I can tell you have a nice personality and you're probably easy to get along with and very, very caring for your students. I, I, I love my students. I absolutely do. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Say. That's it's, awesome. It's a very exciting experience to be teaching. I love it. That's yeah. just such a great thing. And you're in what, what, where are you located? I'm actually located in the Northeast. I'm in Connecticut. Um, I, I moved here just a couple of years ago. Um, I lived in New York state for many, many years with my husband, but um, when he passed away a couple of years ago, I chose to move to Connecticut and I downsized and I have a lovely studio here and, um, it's an artistic community. I have a lot of artists, friends who live in the area and we paint together and draw together. So I, I feel very fortunate that I landed here. So well, I'm, in, I'm in Rhode Island in the summer, so we may have to, oh. it could be just fun. Well, we go out, you You'll know? have to come and visit me in my studio or I could come and visit you in Rhode Island. <laughs> I do that, do that because uh, Sydney's Wonderful. there and it's not beautiful. that far. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, I saw some pictures of your studio. It's just gorgeous. And uh, I'd have to show us around your studio, but I don't know if I tried to do that from my perspective in my studio here on the, in the Monterey Bay, uh -huh. I'd be afraid I'd get everybody dizzy and wipe them out from just not being able to focus on the, <laughs> keep it steady. <laughs> unless, you, unless you think you can right, show right, it. Right. <laughs> but it's a gorgeous studio and I really appreciate okay. what you did for us today. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so, for hosting. Thank you so, so much. Really great. All right. Thank you, everybody. We had Wendy Caparoli, and you can go to windycaparoli.com to look her up. Uh, she will be on Realism Live, which is going to be incredible. That's November the 9th through the 11th. And there's also, there's an Essentials Day on November the 8th for anybody that needs a refresher. So I think you'll find that exciting. Uh, again, if you want to go to uh, any of my videos, it's BillDavidson.biz. Um, that's my website. <laughs> you can just Google Bill Davidson Artist. I think 
four, I think I have four with Streamline and a new one coming out, an actual plain air one coming out. So it was such a pleasure to have everybody with us today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, keep writing those comments. If you have any questions for Wendy, send them in. I'm sure she'll be glad to answer them because she's very thorough and did an incredible job of communicating what she was doing at that point in time. So I don't know. If, I can't thank enough. And uh, also, even though I've been guest hosting, I wonder where Eric Rhodes may be today. I don't know if he's, that's one of the questions. Where is Eric Rhodes? And he's traveling and he's across over in Europe and doing things and doing other art things. So it's all great. So thank you again. I really appreciate you having you in here and um, keep the questions coming. Shoot them to Wendy, shoot them in this comment section. Um, there's a good chance she may be able to get on there and answer some more of them if you have them. And I look forward to you for the rest of the week. We have uh, Jonathan McPhillips coming up tomorrow. Fabulous painter from the New England area. He is one great guy. He's a fantastic communicator and the man can really paint. He's been winning a lot of awards. He can paint all kinds of great scenes. He can almost paint everything and he'll be a lot of fun. And then I have Deborah Hughes on Friday, and she's fantastic, too. She just won a big award out at the Laguna Invitational. Um, she lives out near Laguna, and uh, her works are incredible and exciting. And so I have two stellar artists coming up for you the rest of the week. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I'm really looking forward to being with you the rest of the week. So tune us in, click subscribe, hang in there, and we look forward to seeing you the rest of this week. Thank you so much.